Steve, thanks as always. It's great it's to, good be to see here. you again. And you as well. Um, I think it's been about a year since we last checked in with you in person. It was. We were. Um, it was the opening week of uh, the new headquarters in Chicago, right. which I think was the first week of June. Yes, that's right. So we're coming up on that anniversary, and at this stage, in terms of uh, the remodeling, we're 60% of the way through. Or are we? Probably around 60% on a global basis. I mean, some of our countries have now almost fully completed. Here in the U.S. now we're about 8,500, 9,000 of the 14,000. So we've made a lot of progress in the last year. Yeah. And, and so what are you seeing in terms of traffic trends or comp trends of stores that have been refitted? Well, we see a very similar uplift here in the U.S. to what we see elsewhere in the world. So we'll typically get a kind of mid-single digit sales uplift, a couple of percent on the guest count uplift. And importantly, the customer satisfaction scores are better. You know, customers are enjoying the more modern environment different ways to order, different ways to pay, uh, different ways to customize their food. So we're getting a good response from that. What, we, what strikes me is how dated already the old restaurants look, right? I mean, we're starting to get used to this uh, passing it on the highway and you recognize what the <coughs> new versus, versus the old. And that's why the speed of the remodeling program is important because you, know, you don't want the tail to take too long because they do start to stand out a little bit. But uh, we've got a great commitment from the owner operators and you know, we're helping fund that with them as well. So we're trying to help accelerate the plan as best we can. Are we at a point now where the uh, tick up in sales is more than offsetting the loss in sales during construction? Yeah, we turned that around the first quarter of this year. So last year it was a little bit of a drag because we were remodeling so many restaurants. We had that downtime that you described, but now we flipped a little bit. So it's giving us a little bit of a tailwind as opposed to a headwind, which always helps. We've been watching you in this sort of investment window for a while and it's been part of the experience of the future. You've made some uh, high profile acquisitions and then you guided up, I think, GNA from minus four to flat, right? Yeah, a little bit, yes, because um, I think as we've uh, executed the growth plan, you know, we, we spent the first two years, so three or four years ago, turning the business around. Now we've had a couple of years of growth. And I think we're confident now that we're beginning to identify further opportunities to further accelerate growth. That takes a little bit of research and development cost. It means you've got to bring some expertise into the business to help us do that. But uh, we're still managing, uh, effectively, the running the business GNA is staying the same, and we're putting a little bit more into innovation. When you talk about further opportunity, though, what, what do you mean? Well, we're continuing to see how can we help continue to elevate the experience for customers. So, you know, the, with this pace of change in the world and with different technology and you know, different innovations around, whether it's around food, technology, design, we're seeing opportunities that we think can either make the experience more fun, more enjoyable, or smoother for customers. Right. And if we can find that, we're going to go hard at it. Uh, so, but is it fair to say you're extending sort of this investment window? And at what point, I mean, obviously shareholders are giving you the keys because uh, the stock's been hitting new high after new high. But at what point does that become more of a, a concern for investors? Well, I think we need to continue growing, don't we? And I think if, the, if, if where we're investing that money is helping drive growth, across 37, 38,000 restaurants, then I think the shareholders and investors will be satisfied. And also we want to bring our own operators along with us as well, because they're investing their hard-earned dollars as well. So that always means we've got a business case. You know, the owner operators will want to see a return on their investment, just the same as a shareholder would. So I think that we've got a wonderful check and balance in the system to uh, help us make sure we spend that innovative money in the right way. Mm -hmm. What has dynamic yield brought to you yet so far? A lot of excitement, first of all. So it was our first acquisition for 20 years. Um, and it was an acquisition in a way that was different from the past. It wasn't looking at different restaurant businesses to try and expand our footprint. It was bringing a capability, an IP, and some talent into our business that can help us accelerate the growth, growth model. So we completed the deal mid-April. Within two weeks, we had that technical capability in 800 drive throughs here in the US. So it's a very, very rapid execution implementation. People have been asking for real world examples. Uh, buy an apple pie, maybe it suggests coffee. Uh, you've talked about having it during peak periods reduce stress on the crew. How does that work? Yeah, so I mean, very simply put, I mean, in the online world, when we're shopping online and we pick an item, we put it into our shopping basket, any website we're on these days will automatically suggest two or three things to go along with it. People who buy that tend to like these things as well. We're the first business that we're aware of that can bring that into the physical world. So as customers are at the menu board, maybe they're ordering a coffee, we could suggest, suggest a dessert. Or if they're ordering a quarter pounder with cheese, we can suggest making that into a meal. So it's really just taking um, 
data and machine learning and AI, all these sort of clever technical capabilities these days. And, and the best benefit for customers is we're more likely to suggest things they do want and less likely to suggest things they don't want. So it'll just be a nicer experience for the customer. But yes, for the, for the restaurant itself, because we can put our drive-through service times in there, for example, this, the capability, when it mines all the data, the technical capability will be to suggest items that are easier to make at our busier times. So therefore, that'll help smooth the operation mm -hmm. as well. But it's, it's going to drive ticket more than it drives traffic in this particular case. I think the immediate sense we'll see will be some ticket, but frankly, if the overall experience is better, customers come back more often. So that's ultimately where the success will be, is driving you know, repeat visits and, and getting people back more often. What do you think's, what do you think's holding back traffic, right? And when do you start lapping traffic pos positive? Well, I think across the entire sector, traffic right. is tight Absolutely. right now. And people are eating out less, would you believe or not? And they have been progressively eating out less for a number of years whether it's the advent of f home delivery, for example, which is something we participate in, as you know. But uh, at the moment, it's just a little bit tight out there. And uh, so it's a fight for market share. Anyone who is getting growth, typically, is because they're adding new units. People are finding it hard to get that like-for-like -like guest count growth. It's something that we have stated as an ambition of ours. We think that's a, a measure of the true health of the business. And uh, last quarter, we did grow traffic. And we've grown traffic the last couple of years, but only modestly. And you know, we want to we want to be stronger than that. Mm -hmm. Labor, right? Under severe pressure now to to raise wages. Uh, you've instituted some anti-harassment uh, training, but wh where is the employee in terms of their relationship to, to McDonald's? And do you think 15 on a federal level is a reasonable possibility? I think overall, if you look around the world, actually, not just the US, we're looking at all of our both mature and emerging markets, we're finding the labor pool is getting tighter and tighter. And when you're in the service industry like we are, we have to have well-motivated and fully staffed restaurants. So, uh, so yeah, we, we um, are working hard on making sure we keep turnover reduced, we keep pay competitive, and we know our owner operators, you know, as local businessmen and women in their local communities, they know what the going rate is because they want to staff their restaurants and provide the overall experience. But it is tight. We're finding this, this is tight than it's been for a number of years. Company owned starts at 10 an hour? It averages around 10. It doesn't start at 10 because the different parts of the country have different starting rates. But uh, overall, we're at just over $10 an hour Can now. Can you see that taking a stair step function up? I think, I think it will continue to go up, yeah. I think that's inevitable as the fight for talent continues. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why we want to keep growing the business so you can absorb some of those you know, higher costs so you can, because we don't ever want to impact the customer experience. That's the piece you've got to stay very, very protective of. So you've got to pay the going rate to keep staff motivated and, and, and fulfill their ambitions in other ways. It's not just the pay, it's the training, it's the opportunities. So uh, you know, we're helping them with, with tuition and education assistance, for example, and obviously career progression. So you know, there's a number of different factors we're, we're, we're trying to employ in our adult restaurants at a local level to make sure the workforce is motivated and, uh, and we keep turnover mm -hmm. down whilst people are fighting for the best talent. On commodities, I think you see up 2 to 3% for the year? That's right. We're seeing that. And we've had to nudge that guidance up a little as well. You know, there's been you know, one or two unexpected factors such as... Uh, African you know, swine fever. So African swine fever hurts us a little bit on the pork, for instance. So you know, that limits the movement of pork and therefore pushes the price up here in the U.S. And you know, pork products, part of our breakfast business, it's an important part of it. But... You know, we've got a, a well-established supply chain. We're trying to hedge wherever we possibly can and minimize the impact of these things. But the reality is, you know, we're subject to the same kind of pressures on these as everyone else. You were asked about alternative meat, I think, on the call. Um, and you th as a, from the company standpoint, you expressed some interest. You've yeah. got, th there's a it's vegan burger, right? Yeah, it's interesting. We've got a vegan burger going in Germany at the moment. It's on a promotional basis. But uh, when you look at the whole meat substitute type ideas, um, I, I think what will be interesting for us will be to see who is particularly interested in that. Is it an existing customer who wants just an alternative option? Is it bring a new customer in? So we're, we're exploring that. We're trying to understand it better and also understand their you know, customer's acceptability of that particular type of product because there's a lot of buzz around it at the moment, but it, it's, it's, it's clearly prepared in a different way to a traditional beef patty is. So. Uh, but we, we, we're keeping a close eye on it and uh, watch this space. It, it, you, your answer on the call about it involved complexity, right? And whether it brings another layer of complexity to the kitchen. 
Well, it undoubtedly does. It does, so, just uh, in preparation. Undoubtedly does, because you've got to obviously segregate the tools you use and the grills from, from beef products, because some people you know, clearly are purchasing it because they, they are not beef eaters. So, so we know there's complexity. The question is, will the demand make it worth absorbing the complexity because it will drive the business? I mean, we had a similar discussion maybe four years ago around all-day breakfast, where it certainly adds complexity to the operation, but the demand was sufficient that you know, we want to find a way to absorb that. So, you know, it's, uh, it's something that we're certainly taking a good look at. Does, it, does the buzz feel faddish to you, though, on alternative, on alternative meat? I, I, don't, I don't think it's faddish. Whether it maintains its same level of buzz, I think, is what's interesting. Because, you know, like any other restaurant business, you want throughput. You want to keep serving the items so you can keep them fresh and well-prepared. And, the, the, you know, our, our teams in the restaurants, the crew and the managers, are well-trained in preparing them. So you really want to have a certain volume of those to actually keep it you know just to keep the finished menu item fresh and, and, and hot and fresh for the, for the customer so you know we, we'll we'll take we're taking a, a little look at this one <laughs> there's been a lot of sell side research on uh, uh, beyond meat for example and one of the bullish arguments is that a major qsr customer will sign by year end I mean, how likely is it that that's an, that ends up being mcdonald's uh, absolutely no idea at this stage but i mean uh, the one thing about the job I have is McDonald's attracts attention no matter what it is that you're doing. And uh, you know, clearly anyone who has something they want to get scale to will often look to McDonald's to be that partner to help scale in, in any way, shape or form. Right. So, uh, well, if you, we were, if you stepped on, on the scale, I mean, we know what you did to chicken during when McNuggets came. I mean, you, the whole market uh, <clears throat> sort of tips on, on the well, you, leg stools. And you've also got to look at just the sheer volumes we, we require, just because you know, we serve around the world 70 million customers a day. So if I just take the cage-free eggs example here in the US, when we made the announcement, that was going to be a, a, you know, a five-year announcement to transition across, because it takes that amount of time to make sure there's that sufficient supply so you can meet the demand. So you know, these are all the factors you've got to take into do you just launch your test in the city? Do you launch in just one particular region or, or a smaller market elsewhere in the world and test these things out when the, the, the kind of the, the volume can meet the p potential demand? So we'll see, but we're, we're pretty familiar with trying new items and new products and how we can test and assess. And frankly, the customer will always be the decision maker on this one. We did a documentary on McDonald's over a decade ago and a big part of that piece was about the company's ambitions in China. Uh, it was a big strategic right. step. And now where does that stand in light of everything we now know about our, the U.S. relationship? I think inevitably it remains a big bet for us. Absolutely. We've got new strategic partners there, which was, uh, uh, so we've got new partners with, within the country now who have actually accelerated the restaurant opening program. So last year they opened over 400 restaurants in 2018. They opened another 400 restaurants in this current year. It has now become the second largest market by restaurant number in our entire 120 markets, just after the US. So um, we're exactly where we want to be. We've got a really strong presence in the tier one cities, and now the partners are helping us expand into tier three, four, and five cities, going further west through China. And we're confident in the market, and we're confident in the partners we've got there. How do you quantify or characterize risk uh, to the brand uh, as an American brand? Um, to regulatory pressures in response to something we might do as a, as a country? I mean, ultimately, none of this is new to us because we operate in 120 countries around the world. So th there are always going to be issues at a geopolitical level or a macroeconomic issue. And part of our strength is our di diversification. So clearly, we want to be sensitive to it, clearly. But having that local ownership helps localize McDonald's in China. And we have a minority partner as well from the US as well. So. Yeah, I think we have a good balance now between the ownership there and, uh, and, and the future we have. And you know, clearly, wherever we try and establish our business, we will have local supply chains as best we can, local management, local owner operators, and localized McDonald's to be as effective as we can. And I think consumers recognize that, different menus, different tone of voice, you know, different style of marketing. So that, I think, entirely or helps insulate any sort of issues if there was if, uh, any events unfold. All right. But fair to say, all the recent tension has not altered 
McDonald's strategic or tactical strategies in China? Absolutely not. In the shorter term, businesses slow down a little bit, just as the economy is slowed down a little bit in China. But in the terms of long-term interest, it's a very important market for us, and I think we'll stay that way for, for as long as I can imagine. Last thing here, Ed, you've been at the company, I think, 15 quarters now. And in that time, you've changed the food, the restaurants, uh, M&A. Uh, I just wonder, um, given the string of uh, comp growth, how you feel about your tenure at this stage. We know what the stock's done. Yeah, I mean, it's less about my tenure. It's more around, I think, getting the sort of the culture of the business one where we've got more speed, more agility, open-minded to taking a little more risk. And fortunately, that has been working. I think we're getting more things right than wrong. So, yes, if we complete this current quarter, then that'll be 16 quarters of growth, so four consecutive years. And uh, momentum is a really powerful word in businesses like ours because momentum builds confidence with confidence at that local level you staff the restaurants you maintain them well people just feel just more open to risk taking more open to investing and that helps continues to fuel that cycle of success and uh, so we feel satisfied with where we're at but we know we can always do better